Vultures, the coach of something they been into So if you never gave them a view I recommend you do Cause when they question guests They message is not subliminal It don't matter if you a rookie Or at your pinnacle They gon' touch on stuff that you did And what you finna do It's uncensored too Yo, they never had a goofy show But I saw some boys on they show Acting goofy though Well, if you think they L stupid though You would get exposed Like the hoes on OnlyFans Letting coochie shit to introduce the show when I sent this to Sam Axe, oh God, that nigga said, oh God, you the man, Cass. I spit white like a clan mask, and I'm a hustler. I could stand out on the beach and sell sandbags. Some things can last, but this ain't just a podcast. This is Sam Ant and oh God, Cass. Hip hop uncensored is the vibe, so subscribe. Hip hop uncensored is the vibe, so subscribe. Oh God, driving Sam and riding passenger side, and you heard it out the mouth of the greatest rapper alive. Hip hop uncensored is the vibe, so subscribe. Hip hop uncensored is the vibe, so subscribe. Oh God, driving Sam and riding passenger side, and you heard it out the mouth of the greatest rapper alive. Go gang. Uncensored Podcast. I'm your brother, old guy from Hip Hop News. Uncensored and sitting across from me is my co host. What up, what up, y'all? It's your man, Sam, and CEO of Viral Hip Hop News. You're in the building for a very special edition of the Hip Hop Uncensored Podcast because live in studio, we got the good brother, Mr. Yeah. Andrew Wyatt. On the Hip Hop A Sense of Pockets. How you doing today, family? Man, I'm doing great, fam, man. Thanks for having me, man. And man, what a beautiful studio, man. And it was just a pleasure to be here. You know, I flew to Philly just to do this show because I'm just so impressed with you guys, man, and just honored to be here. Thank you. The Thanks. honor is all of ours. Definitely appreciate and humbled by the kind words and yes, all the beautiful pleasantries you came into the building with. We were going to be happy to get you virtually, but we got you in studio, and we're yeah. going to absolutely make the most of it. And we appreciate you once again. So for the people who don't know, if you've been living under a rock the last couple of years here on the podcast, explain who you are and what exactly you do, sir. Andrew Wyatt, as you know, my company is Purpose PR Firm. I started in 2007. I have a public relations crisis management firm. So what I come in, I, you know, I brand, I do reputation rebuilding. Uh, and when a crisis hits someone, uh, like you've seen with Mr. Cosby or anybody, it seemed, same as R. Kelly, who I worked with for behind the scenes for five years helping his family, uh, giving them advice on how to handle the situation and how to handle the media, how to handle social media, how to uh, get your story told because they're going to block your story now. So uh, I worked I worked in the news business, man. I learned this, this thing uh, working for ABC and Fox News for 12 years and they taught me, you know, being in your 20s, you know, I came out of the projects in Bessemer, Alabama and uh, South Bessemer, man, and it, pretty rough. And uh, they always call Bessemer the Compton of Alabama, uh, a rough area side of town, man. Uh, uh, brother and sister uh, raised and adopted by my grandparents, my mother's parents. My brother and I had a carried a family last name. Uh, own and my mom's only child and my my mom and dad agreed for that and it turned out the best man I'm named after my grandfather and um, I wanted to be just like them so I have a daughter but uh, I remember uh, probably at six years old sitting on the floor of the projects and my grandmother uh, we call Bay affectionately her name's Willie Dell Wyatt but uh, she has a seventh grade education it was 14 of them and and Mr. Cosby, I used to watch him on Electric Company, teaching me my ABCs, man. Wow, wow. And I looked at her, and I was like, I want to do that one day. Wow. At six years, I want to do that one day. And she was like, boy, shit your mouth. <laughs> and this is a lady who like taught me how to bake cakes, cook, clean. But she took her last breath in my arms when I was 15. Mm, wow. And it took me, you know, south in a, in a synth. Uh, of, of of not knowing how to deal with that, handle that. I slept with this lady till I was fifteen. She just taught me everything. Right. But I I meant that I was going to fulfill that dream. Well, I said I was going to do that, and uh, went to college at Miles College and 
played football for just Lanier High School, uh, won the state championship in 92, and I uh, went on matriculated in Miles College, and then uh, it was an opportunity to open up at ABC 3340 News where they needed a black intern, and yeah. was they, they had never had a black intern from uh, an HBCU, a historically black college or university. I was the first one, worked up three days, and they hired me. Wow. But um, the news business, man, because... You know, you come from not having anything, and people say, you know, whether you want to call the hood, low economic, urban, whatever you want to call it, you come from not having it, and you want to fit in. And part of fitting in, you know, you know your history, but you're trying to fit in, right. and you're trying to, you know, impress these white people, and they say that you watch them, you know, in the studios and in the control room when a shooting or a murder happens in our community, our black community. They said, go get the worst person you can find in the community to talk. Mm. Go get wow. the worst looking person. And I would hear them say that white people, white producers, yeah. directors. And I was like, wow, you know, and I, it, it, it angered me, but. I didn't have the influence and the power because I was trying to learn their game. Yeah. And I just said to myself, I want to figure out their game. I started out running cameras and engineering, audio, uh, worked my way up to producing shows, worked my way up to selling shows, selling all the advertising shows. I worked in every division of a TV station because I said, once I learn this game, I'm going to be able to go out on my own. And I'm going to be able to do for my, my people yeah. and how they used to teach us to set people up and get a scandal on people, a political figure. Wow. They said, well, f go and find out what you know their hangout spots. And we call it down south, hole in the walls. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll go to the hole in the wall. You'll see the mayor, for example, with his girlfriend. He's married. And you'll get shots of it. Wow. And so I know how the media works. And I understand how this game works. And and that was the purpose of my starting this firm, man. I always said when people say the name purpose, you know, it came to me in a dream. And I said, you know, everybody's talking about the creator, the most high. So, you know, I'm I'm doing it in those steps, man. And uh and it's 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 not an easy situation because your objective is to figure out how can I beat them at a game that they created. Mm. Because it's just like the law. Once we figure out that law, they have the formula to change it and reshape it. Uh, and, and that's what what I do, man. I come in and uh, I don't do all the glitz and glamour. What more you see the Hollywood PR people do. Uh, when a crisis come along, same way you saw with Will Smith. Mm. His public just apologize. Mm -hmm. That's all that they know to say because they're trying to keep their checks rolling in. Right. Would I have told him to do that? No. Uh, I would have said to him uh, something to the effect of, hey, what I did was out of character, but I didn't help myself. I really hurt this film mm. because now I'm not, people won't go see this film. Right. And for that, you guys can have this Oscar back. You give them mm. that back because it don't belong to you anyway yeah. it's really theirs but you didn't do it that way and now they said well we're gonna ban you for 10 years so that's that's kind of just to give an example of what i do and the advice i give and and i i structure relationships i tell everybody most people collect cars mm -hmm. some people collect jewelry some people collect artwork i collect people yeah. It's like you guys, um, you, you, you're part of my collection. Yes, so uh, I, I wanted to fly in and say, hey, if I'm going to collect these people and what they're doing on their show, which is so positive, and it's reaching a whole audience that might not know a Bill Cosby, mm -hmm. uh, because the Cosby show is not running like Martin is running yeah. or Sanford and Son or the Jeffersons. Uh, they wanted to take that education away uh, Fat Albert is not running. Uh, those clean cartoons. And, and we, we want to just give a different vibe, man. And, and, and my vibe and the way I vibe is is re repairing the legacy of our, our black icons. Powerful. Awesome. I want to um, kind of turn our attention to R. Kelly. You said you worked with him and his, his family for a while. What do you think about the recent verdict 
that happened with R. Kelly. And can you kind of give us a little bit of insight into that whole case? If we don't really know too much about it, but a lot of just speculation from the media. Well, you know, let me let me first say this. I've been getting, I started a, I stayed away from social media. Okay. And I just launched a social media page when I was in Santa Monica for the civil suit with mm-hmm. Mr. Cosby. And I stayed away from it because I always said social media was created to take black people away from current events of the day. Mm-hmm. You get a quick sound bite and you believe it and yeah. you automatically deem somebody to be guilty just because of something you saw on social media. Mm-hmm. But I was doing Tariq Nasheed's show and the Care Dangerous show. And his brother on the Carry Dangerous show, Run, said, brother, you know, you're in PR. They're going to try to block your messaging and your story. You should consider that. And when I got to Santa Monica for the civil trial, that's mm-hmm. what they tried to do. So I launched the Instagram account uh, just wow. four weeks ago, right. uh, to yeah. be exact. And uh, I launched it, and mm-hmm. I just started doing my own reporting. I went back to my roots, yes, sir. and I went back to my TV days and said, look, I, even though I was behind the scenes, I know how to report. I know mm-hmm. how to do my own news. Mm-hmm. But with Robert, um, Robert was in a situation where I was reached out to, and, and I'm saying this because I'm getting a lot of DMs on social media, like, why, would, why won't you help Robert? You know, Why won't you come out here and do something for him? Right. Why won't you speak? You say you're, you're for black people. Yeah. Well, I've been working behind the scenes and never asked for one dime. Let me be very clear. Never asked for one dime. I didn't want any money. Mm-hmm. I just saw where he was going. Bill Cosby, Mr. Cosby became the litmus test. All right, they developed a formula, tried to and tested wow. on how to destroy his legacy and career. Mm-hmm. Well, we got the formula. Mm-hmm. And so yeah. since we got the formula and it was it was created, you know, by, by coming after Mr. Cosby. Mm-hmm. I tried to just talk to Robert. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I tried to convey to his people and even him is Hugh Hefner started the Playboy Mansion in the 60s in Chicago. Okay, Mm -hmm. if a white man had to leave Chicago with the Playboy Mansion, what makes you think you could be the black Hugh Hefner living in the Trump Towers with two young women and you've been accused of, 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 you know, having sex with young Black girls. Mm-hmm. Now, first off, since when has America ever cared about black women and black girls? Right. Never. Yeah. But just when listen, and, and the guy who he hired as his crisis manager, Darrell Johnson, mm-hmm. Darrell lied to him and told him that he was Bill Cosby's crisis manager. Oh. So mm-hmm. one of our former attorneys called me, mm-hmm. where R. Kelly's attorney, Steve Greenberg, at the time, and said, look, this is Andrew. He could tell you that this guy's making it up. They, the, 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 the Jewish guy, Greenberg, brings him on anyway. And they're, he has signed a deal where he's getting Robert, the way Robert was paying him, he, he was signing over his royalty checks to this guy. Wow. Man. And so that's what Robert, think about why Robert is in this situation. He was trying to get his royalties and own the rights to his catalog, yeah, right? Yeah. And, and so now you're signing your royalties over to Greenberg, your attorney, which that's unethical. Yeah. Unethical. Yeah. So I'm talking to his spiritual advisor, um, a guy, Don Russell, who now is facing federal charges mm-hmm. uh, because Don, uh, he, when he in New York, when it was about to air the documentary, uh, he called in and said that there was a gum in there. So mm-hmm. now he's he got a federal case against him. Wow. Uh, I had Tom Mesero, who represented Michael Jackson, who did the 2018 trial with us. Mm-hmm. I had him to fly to Chicago from L.A. to sit with Robert. Mm. No one would listen. Uh, they would call me, and his his cousin, Keith, who controls everything, uh, along with the private investigator, when I got Mr. Cosby out June 30th, Wednesday, June 30th of last year, mm-hmm. uh, I went to New York. The next day, Mm -hmm. they flew into New York and met with me, gave them the formula, said, look, Mm -hmm. somebody has to tell his story. He's no longer R. Kelly. Mm -hmm. He's Robert or Mr. Kelly. R. Kelly is a stage. They've destroyed the stage. Now we have to humanize him. This is a man who was molested and raped by his sister, who peed on him. Whenever you saw him 
get out of, of jail, bonded mm-hmm. out, he always ended up at McDonald's. Reason yeah. why is because that's where his mother took him. Wow. And that's how he always felt her energy. Uh, at the McDonald's, and he felt safe, and so he always went to McDonald's. Mm-hmm. There, were, there, there's issues that he can't read, he can't write. Mm-hmm. But if, if 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 America just knew his story, and and the fact that the, his legal team did not, you did not depose one record executive. They were complicit. You know, you guys are in the, you guys understand the music world, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And you, you understand that very, you know, hey, we on a, a hip hop show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, and, and we understand in the music game, these artists don't go out and get people. It's, 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 it's the roadies, it's the security, it's the managers. When you're hot and you're making them money mm-hmm. and you're going platinum, they get you the girls, they bring you the bag of money. You know, I remember. Well, my friends were promoting, he's passed away, William Sims, we called him Tanky. He had R. Kelly on tour, Prince on tour. Uh, and I used to be backstage. I used to watch mothers tell their daughters to take off their underwear. Mm. Wow. I've seen this. And you mean to tell me they're not held accountable, the parents are not? As Mr. Cosby say, the revolution starts in the home, right? Yes, sir. And so... It was those things, what I wanted to do for him. And I was in a train station uh, last year, and his cousin Keith called me, and I recommended attorney Jennifer Bungeen. Mm-hmm. And she told me she was talking to them, and she's our attorney. And uh, I said, well, Keith is the one that that has the means and resources to pay you. Mm-hmm. And I connected them on a text message, and that's how she got involved. Okay. And I've always told them I didn't want a dime. Now, I, I, I did tell Keith when we talked, and, and I want to put the truth and facts out here. I don't believe in hiding anything yes, behind the door. So mm-hmm. when people come back at your show, I want them to and they make whatever comments. Yeah. I want to put it all out here. I don't do halfway stories yes, mm-hmm. uh, because this is not a halfway house show. Yeah, yeah. So, sure. uh, so this is the real. This I do the real stories and and I do I stick with the truth and mm-hmm. the facts, man. Mm-hmm. And and one thing I said to him, I said, look, it would cost you would have to pay me something because I would have to travel. Mm-hmm. I would have to do this. I would have to, you know. I, Expenses, yeah. uh, and, yeah. and you know, because it, it gets expensive when you go live in a in a city. You have to go live in a hotel. You have to mm-hmm. do this. You have to develop relationships. Mm-hmm. You have to be out here working the public. You know, you you got to part of doing what I do. I have to be in the streets. Okay, Damn. I got to go in the hood because I know what the street committee. They're the ones that know any and everything. Mm-hmm. They're the ones that could possibly be on these juries. Uh, they could be potential jurors, yeah. and their minds are already tainted. Mm-hmm. So now I got to go hang out in whatever spot I need to hang out at. I don't care how rough it is. Mm-hmm. Look, I, I tell everybody one one thing I don't fear is my people. Yes, you know I'm careful, mm-hmm. and I understand, mm-hmm. but I don't fear my people. That's right. And, and when you don't fear your people. They, that gives you a certain amount of respect where you could go into certain hoods and everybody be like, oh, you here? Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. it's, it's like you you hanging out on, on the corner at the White House, right. get some get some subs. Yeah. Like, yeah. a guy came up to me, are you serious? Like, look, yeah. I'm just a regular guy, mm-hmm. regular dude. And they didn't understand that part of aspect of it. Of, of that I would have to go and tell his, his story. So when TMZ caught me in Beverly Hills last year, when he was, uh, when, when Robert was found guilty, mm-hmm. and they said, what do you think? I said, well, he was railroaded. Yeah. He was, because how do you take a RICO law? Right. Uh, now, a RICO law, this law was passed in 1970 by Congress to take down crime families. Crime families. Okay, now you're gonna take it into into sex trafficking. Mm-hmm. They, they're right. designing the formula on how to take successful black men, whether you're, especially if you're entertainment, uh, you're you're athlete, uh, 
defining unique ways now. They're using a RICO law. Mm-hmm. A RICO law. He wasn't smuggling drugs. He didn't have any casinos. Right, right. Uh, you treating this man like he's Bugsy Siegel. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. And, and you go and, and you go and, uh, and you use this law to say, well, but he was trafficking young girls. You didn't use that law against uh, Jeffrey Epstein. Nope. Good point. Wow. Boy, Think about it. Yep. You, you didn't you you didn't use that law against Gashleen Gish, Maxwell. Right. Yep. She got twenty years. Okay. Mm-hmm. But did you ever hear Rico? Nope. Sure didn't. So think about what they're doing. They're restructuring, as I said mm-hmm. earlier. When we figure out the laws, because they created the laws, they restructure the laws. Yep. And 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 they restructure the laws because first of all, they understand that. If you want a black person to read something, put it in a book because mm-hmm. we're not going to open the book. Mm-hmm. And they understand that they got our attention focused on materialistic things, social media. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, how can I get the next, you know, Gucci or Birkin bag? How can I live this life that's fictional? It's, it's not, it's, it's, it's tinsel town. Yep. It's truly that. So that's the background on Robert. I tried to stop Robert from doing the Gail King interview. Yeah. And I called and called and what Darrell did, he set the interview up mm-hmm. and Oprah funneled money in. Mm. And Robert never got to see a dime of it. Mm. And so look what Gail did. She let him stand up. Even though he was emotional, right. that's why he shouldn't have never done an yep. interview. Exactly. Because, look, we all got pulled over by a, tra- by a cop with a traffic ticket. And we get emotional. Mm-hmm. Because we know yeah. we didn't run that red light. We know you're profiling us. Well, it's certain when you're in those heightened situations, you have to now take a step back and say, this is not the time that I go and do a sit-down interview. Robert tried to repair himself. You can't repair yourself. You have to have somebody else who's not in your realm, mm-hmm. not in your world to repair you. I'm not in your world. Right. I'm not in your realm. I'm not out here cutting the album. I'm not doing the show. Right. My, my, my job is to use my image and tie my image to you and say that I'm not perfect because every man has his fallacies and mm-hmm. idiosyncrasies. Mm-hmm. I'm not a perfect but what I can do, I could tell you a story. Let someone else tell your story. But see, they coerced him with money that he never got to see. And, and, and you never know who, who they're putting around you to set you up. Go, go back, man, to those Godfather movies. And I tell everybody, I said, the Italians... Which they they made the Italian mafia mafia part of American history, believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> but but go back and look at those movies. The people who were setting somebody up was always on the inside. It was part of someone yeah. connected to the family, right? Yeah. But see, the way the Italians had it set up, they had the local the local law enforcement. They had all of that on lock. Mm-hmm. But the Jewish mafia had the federales. Mm. And the Jewish mob is the ones that took down the Italian mob. Wow. Go look at the history. Yeah. Study the history. And when you understand who controls and owns uh, the industry, the entertainment industry, the record businesses, the television network, Jewish guys. Yep. Yep. <sighs> Absolutely. You know, when we, started, when we started our media platforms and we decided to do this, we seen everything that was going on around us and we decided to... <clears throat> As much as we love some of the characters in play, take it strictly down to truth. You know what I mean? Keep the truth away from narrative. And what we see is a lot of people in a lot of platforms nowadays is they mix up and they kind of poison the truth with a lot of narrative. We don't try to do that. We try to keep it right down the middle. We try to do it with Mr. Cosby. We try to do it with R. Kelly as best as possible, even though we adored these people when they were doing their specific specialties. How damaging is the media how damaging is social media in particular to cases like this when they kind of intertwine truth and narrative how how dangerous could that be for people like r kelly or mr cosby look it's a weapon of mass destruction wow yeah. because your story would never get told you would get drowned out 
it, you, you might as well go jump into the Atlantic mm. and and try to survive that way and swim to Cuba or somewhere <laughs> because <laughs> because you know you might as well go to a country where you could be safe and they can't get you because once once they tie those dynamics together and remember now these are entities believe it or not, owned by men they're not owned by women right. so you see women who are being used as puns and and being funneled whatever they they have been funneled to go out here and create these accusations and, ac- and allegations but men are telling them to do that mm-hmm. you know and but when it, it's so it's toxic because once they now have figured out if I want to turn, I got to first turn his community against him. All right. That's the first community I got to turn. Because, see, if I don't get his community first, then it's going to look like uh, they're going to say racism. This is a race war. Right. So what we have to do now, we got to figure out a way to turn his community against him. The way we do that, social media. We put stuff on Instagram. We go get Dream Hampton, who, if you look at her history and career, she was hanging with Jay-Z and all the players and hanging out with the hip-hop community, partying with them, drinking with them. We get someone, a black woman, to destroy the black man. Mm -hmm. That's the new formula now. You know, I I tell everybody the vagina now is inflation. It's a new form of inflation, you know, because uh, <laughs> because now if, if if you know you 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 dip into it and it could cost you, yeah. you know. <laughs> and, and, and I won't my, I won't use what my grandmother said. She said she said boy, she she used another word, but she said the vagina is a hairy bank and all you can do is make deposits. <laughs> and so, and so, but but. When you tie those things together in social media, now mainstream media lives on those platforms, yeah. and they follow regular people. Mm-hmm. They're, they're not following just the celebrities. They're following regular people. They're following your show now, yeah. and they're listening to what I'm saying. Now they're going to keep monitoring your show, and will they eventually try to monetize your words, and will they eventually try to say, all right, let's, let's shut their connection down? I don't know, but... If, if your show is based on truth and facts, and that's why I tell everybody, eventually you would drown out the narrative. If you stick with the truth and the facts, you don't have to be sensationalizing anything, man. Yeah. Uh, I think what we have a tendency to do, we, we say, well, they're stretching a lot. I'm going to do an add-on. You can't do what they do. You know, Your formula is, is what I tell everybody. It's like the long-handed math. Don't go to the shortcut. Don't shortcut the ingredients out the pound cake. Mm. There's a specific reason why it's the pound cake and the upside down cake, whatever. Don't shorten the ingredients because when you leave out the baking powder, it's not going to rise. Right. And so stick with the facts and the truth. And that's what I always stay on to tell everybody. And I, I listen to Mr. and Mrs. Cosby every day. to stay on the mountaintop. Stay on the mountaintop. You know, if you stay on the mountaintop, that's where our stories are located. That's how you can you can spill out the truth. And and all I I tell everybody, you you got to read. Media has figured out human behavior, mm-hmm. and when you study human behavior and the human mind, all it takes now is a headline. If I give you the headline, you're not going to read the article, right? You're just going to see guilty. You're not going to look at what that person is guilty of. Uh, and I, I just, that's why I say it's a weapon of mass destruction. Now, if, if I don't have a problem with social media. I, my problem is that nobody's socializing. Yeah. Nobody's using it, what it was designed for. And now these white guys are saying, okay, how can we destroy this particular community? You know, and now we see somebody see you, Sam, uh, rolling up in your car. And they said, well, they don't see how hard you work to get it. They just want it now. Yeah. And they feel that they deserve it. Yeah. Uh, they, they they feel that, you know, well, I, I see him on social media. He has his own show. He has a studio. All right. That bothers them. Mm-hmm. And, and, but But one thing about before social media... We knew how to earn it. 
and and yeah. that's that's what we have to get back to earning. Absolutely. So take us to Mr. Cosby. Um, when was your first time being introduced to his case? What was the first time meeting him and being hired to you know represent him if you can? I uh, I met. It's, it's kind of funny, man. Um, back home in Alabama in Birmingham, uh, I was representing SCLC. Okay. Martin Luther King Jr.'s organization, Southern Christian Leadership yeah. Conference. And I, in Atlanta, Georgia, they're based off of Auburn Avenue. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was brought in because the doors were about to be shut. Mm -hmm. And they needed to raise like $2 million. Mm -hmm. And so uh, a attorney friend of mine, Tom Larkin, he called his cousin, uh, who was the president of SCLC, the late Howard Creasy. And, um, and another attorney who since pa who's, who passed away, Charles Mathis. Mm -hmm. So they told him about me, and they said, "Well, this guy can help you raise the two million dollars in a short amount of time." Mm -hmm. uh, because what I used to go out and do, I took everything the TV station taught me. You know, I would sell all the time in American Idol, the NFL games. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, all of the spots they gave me, commercial spots. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, you go out to these corporations and a lot of clients of mine were L.A., New York, all over the place. Mm -hmm. And so I knew I had a formula of getting money for, you know, organizations. Mm -hmm. And I got a call from a young lady who's now uh, an attorney. You knew with Dajio. And she was a news anchor at ABC 3340. And they said, Bill Cosby's coming to town mm. and coming to Birmingham. Right. I want to get an interview with him. And Gary Kelly, the news director, white guy, he said, the only person I know in the state of Alabama that could get to the president of the United States is Andrew White. You should call him. Mm. So they called me. She called me. Then the mayor of Birmingham at the time, Mayor William Bell, he reached out and said, I want to give Cosby the key to the city. Can you get to him? Wow. Then my alma mater, Miles College, who I was also representing, mm -hmm. and Miles is the only historically black college in the, in the Birmingham area. Okay. Everywhere else, they're an hour away. Okay. And uh, President French, who's a former, former president of Miles, and now he's at Clark University in Atlanta, he said, man, Dr. Cosby, he did a fundraiser for Miles in 1990, and we took the money was used to pay the water bill and keep the doors open. We didn't give mm -hmm. it to the students. Right. So Mr. Cosby vowed, and I think he did an article in USA Today or something that he would never help Miles College again. Oh wow! Mm -hmm. So because they didn't use the money for the students. Right. And I remember that because I was in high school and my mom. That's how I ended up at Miles. Some other channels too, mm -hmm. but my mom was director of admission at Miles. Okay. And so, um, so Miles asked me to get to him. Then the SCLC. Oh, okay. So, wow. I I told everybody I could. <laughs> yeah. Now everybody. Now here's the trick. Everybody yeah. paid me five grand. Okay. Mm. So, <laughs> I'm on this hook. Right? Yeah, yeah. To to get to Bill Cosby. Right. And now. I'm sweating bullets uh -huh. because <laughs> I don't, I, you know, I got to call around. So I had to go, I had to call his agency, William Morris. Mm -hmm. I, I, it felt like I went through 35 people and yeah. uh, I was representing working with Robin Givens. I had worked with a lot of people, man. And um, through my company and starting in 2007 and, but you know, Cosby to get to him mm -hmm. and finally, I was driving, man. I was on 459, driving on the interstate, and I get a call. Mm. And something said, well, a Massachusetts number. Who are <laughs> Right. I'm, I'm not going to answer it. And then something said, you better answer it. Mm -hmm. And I answered it, and it was him. Whoa. And he said, hey, why are you looking for me? <laughs> 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 you just, his distinctive voice was like, yeah. it was like a, you know, it was like somebody saying, you know, I'm gonna send my boys to come after right, you right. because what, you know what you what, what do you want with me? Right, right. And um, I um, I told him. He said, "Okay." He said, "Get get get Kim Harjo on the phone. Call her back. She'll 
explain everything to you when I'm coming in. Mm-hmm. My pilots would be bringing me. In. I was like, your pilots, like, man, dang. like, <laughs> like, you, you, you got your own pilots, right. yeah. you know, like, <laughs> something you hear, every day, pilots. <laughs> and he said, he said, yeah, my my, he said my pilots would be bring me. I said, hey man, by the way, man, you know we remember the same fraternity Omega Psi Phi. He's like, really? <laughs> and uh, he said, I need you to read this book, man. About these, this family in, in in Baltimore, who they felt that their kids were safer to ship their kids off to Africa's in the jungles to learn than live in Baltimore. Wow. It's black families. Yeah. And I said, "Oh, really?" He said, "Yeah, read that, man." Mm-hmm. He said, "But work out all the details." I got my concert coming there in February. And I said, "This." He said, "It's coming in February 2011." I said. Okay, you know whatever, and I and I was shocked. Right, and man, when his when he landed in Birmingham, I'm sitting at the fish market with the late Charles Attorney Charles Mathis, Tom Larkin, and uh, the SCLC Executive Director, female. Mm-hmm. He calls me, "Hey, I'm in your city, man, man. and." Come see me. I said, hey, I'm at the fish market. Do you want something to eat? He said, nah, man, it's mighty nice of you. Nah, my pilots, you know, we had dinner on the plane. I was like, what? <laughs> so now I'm like really tripping, like yeah. dinner on the plane. And and, and right. he had, the, the plane he flew in was the plane he bought Mrs. Cosby for her birthday, a G4. Oh, okay. And so, uh, and she bought him a Pilatus for his birthday. <laughs> and so, so. <laughs> so, so why not? And then uh, he got in, and and I went back stage and uh, the BJCC concert hall, and he said, "Nice to meet you." And he had sight then; mm. he had a little mm. sight where he could see you, and and he was like, "Oh, nice to meet you." He said, "Hey, go find me some young people, man." I said, "Some young people?" He said, "Yeah, go find." He said, "Matter of fact, I gotta, I got to." Uh, meet with the the governor. I got to meet with these people. But man, I need them to get here now because I want to get some rest and and mm-hmm. kick back and eat my Chinese food. <laughs> and I said, oh, I could call them up. He said, what? That machine. Mm-hmm. He's never owned a cell phone right. or a computer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he was like, you you know how to reach every. I said, yeah, I could tell them. He said, I said, look, he said, yeah, I'm supposed to meet with some DJs from a radio station. I said, yeah, I know them personally. I just tell them to come right, early. Right, right. And he's like, really? Wow. Man. You're that connected. And, you know, the president of the SCLC came. They drove over from Atlanta. And every person who, the mayor gave him the key to the city, mm-hmm. everybody who paid me, he did their event. Mm. Awesome. And then he wow. agreed for miles. He said, I'm going to do a, a commencement for you guys. And when they were getting ready to do the, he, that was like two, back in, that was in May mm-hmm. of 20, 2011. And a tornado hit. And Obama went to Tuscaloosa, Alabama, where UA, the University of Alabama, mm-hmm. is located. That's an hour away from Birmingham. Was, okay. And Obama went to the white people. The mayor of Birmingham, he said, man, the tornado hit in Birmingham killed more people. And we lost everything. Mm-hmm. He said, but we, nobody, Obama won't come here. I called Mr. Cosby. He was at his New York home. He said, call my pilots, man. I'm going to come in a day early. Mm. And he came in a day early. He said, but you got to get CNN. He put me through the test. Right. To come. I was like, how do I get CNN to come? Yeah. I told him, I, I said, well, I'm just going to use his name. You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got Bill Cosby. <laughs> and when I said that, they, CNN brought a satellite truck over from Atlanta. And it's only an hour and 45 minutes from Atlanta okay. to Birmingham. Okay. And so... He got in that that Friday, and he toured the area, and brought so much national attention to the black, parvish area, where so many people had, were killed by the tornado. And when a tornado comes through, man, it just takes over everything, tears everything down. And and he was there, and he he even he he gave money, and. When we went the next day, we did commencement. Mm-hmm. He said, Miles was, um, before we, he walked out to give his speech, 
he made the guy pull a sofa in front of him. And he said, he kept telling the president of Miles that he didn't want to get paid. But the president's like, I want to give you something. So he said, well, give me $10,000, but it got to be in plastic, all cash, <laughs> wrapped in plastic. And he was serious. Right, right. Okay. And they brought it to him wrapped in plastic. Wow. And he felt it. He's like, yeah, that's ten grand. Mm. And he, in front of them, he said, here you go, Andrew. And I was like, he's like, put it in your pocket. So I'm stuffing <laughs> this. I'm trying to stuff it in my pocket. And um, he pulled a sofa, like the sofa I'm sitting on. He was like sitting against the wall. And he said, it's not, this is a union place. Let them move the sofa. He said, look, you're tired to Bill Cosby. He said, so be careful, white women. Mm. 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 This is 2011. Yeah. And I was like, what are you talking about? He says, be careful of white women. Mm -hmm. And I didn't think nothing of it. Mm -hmm. And um, he did his speech, and he came in on the G4, and he sent that plane back because Mrs. Cosby needed to go somewhere. And then next thing we know, there's another plane at the airport. Dang. You know, he has his other plane, and they're matching planes, you know, tan and brown. Right. And his name is on the tail of his plane. Billy on the tail of her plane is Camille. Wow. And uh, we're, we're, we're on our way. <laughs> I'm talking about, this is some real ball stuff. Yeah, I'm yeah, like, yeah, you know, I'm sitting here like, you know, like, this is crazy. And I turned to him. He said, man, I'm going to do two comedy shows for Miles College, and you're going to have to produce them. I said, I, I, I don't know how to produce a show. Right. He said, you'll figure it out. I said, by the way, I got your ten grand. He said, Oh man, keep it. Whoa. Man, you know <laughs> That's love. That's love. We all we see the pictures and we see you sitting side by side with Dr. Cosby during his trial and you you see the ending, but you never hear the journey. You never hear what comes into that. And doing what we do and hearing no's a lot and hearing and getting dead ends a lot, but keeping consistent and keeping going. And to hear your story is inspiring. So we appreciate that. Man, look, show. it was Dick Gregory who said to me, he said when I was working with him, he said, how, how old were you? Because he couldn't believe that I called Bill Cosby at home. And he said, how old were you when you met Cosby? And uh, I said, I was 37 and started working with him. He said, how old was Cosby? I said, 73. He said, what year you was born? I said, 73. He said, look, nigga, the numbers don't lie. It was meant to be. Yeah, and right, so, right. And, and, you know, it was, it was one of those things, man. And, and that's why, you know, I, I try to be consistent. And that's why I do these shows, and that's why I, you know, I figured out from him. That's why I always try to bring love to my people, you know, when I do their shows. And you know, I wanna, I wanna show them, man. I really respect you for, you know, you don't have to give me this platform. You don't have to let my voice be heard. Mm -hmm. And but I wanna. That's my way of giving back. And I'll spend the money to come in on my own dime to say, no, I wanna be with you because. Not only do I want to be with you in the studio to do your show, I just want to meet you. Mm -hmm. And the energy, energy is transferable. Yes, sir. And, and that's how, you know, we should be doing it as a people, man, looking out and helping out, figuring out how to propel the next person. It's not always about money. Right. It could be your it, time. is just so important. And I, I tell everybody, I said the most dangerous word for a black person and it's been since, the, since they brought us here over ships, is the word no. Mm -hmm. Because when you said no master, you get your foot chopped off or you get mm -hmm. murdered. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing with Bill Cosby saying no. When you said no to people, that's, that's, the, that's the most dangerous word for a black person, especially a black man. Cops pull you over, no, officer, I'm not getting out this car because you might shoot me. But they still do it. Mm -hmm. You know, no is dangerous, and, and yes... And the word yes could be the most expensive word because, <laughs> you know, saying yes can cost you. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you have to weigh it. But, man, I'm, I'm just, you know, it's always a pleasure, man, being with brothers who, who are just positive brothers doing your thing, man. Yes, and, 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 and doing and putting the message in out here, the truth. Mm -hmm. No, I don't want no special favors. Right. I just want the facts put out here. I want the story told about how Mr. Cosby got in this situation, why it happened, mm -hmm. and what this is all about. And it's, it's mainly about pictures. 
<laughs> you know, because that's the only evidence. Yeah, we got to talk about that, definitely. Yeah, that's, just, that's the crazy part. Let's, let's, let's get into that. Okay, so we start hearing the news that Mr. Cosby could be potentially put in prison for things that happened decades ago. And then we start unraveling the things and Bill Cosby, his legacy begins to get tarnished. Where were you and, and what's your first point of action when you start seeing these things happen? 2014, fall of 2014, uh, he was putting his art collection on lawn with the Smithsonian. And we were all in D.C. And I set up several interviews for him to do, Gwen Eiffel and Roland Martin. So he did those interviews. And David Brokaw, who had been with him for 40 years, David Dad was Mr. Cosby's agent, Norm, the great Norman Brokaw, who was the chairman of William Morris, who got Cosby, the Cosby Show, and all of that. Right. Uh, they, David Cosby sits down with the AP, Associated Press, and with him and Mrs. Cosby, we remember, and they brought up the allegations. And he said, sir, if, you know, you'll be so kind, I would like for you to destroy that, asking that question. And he was trying to protect his wife, yeah. like any man would. If you, you know, first of all, why are you bringing up allegations in front of my wife? Why were you bringing up? Th that's petty, you know. You know, for th that goes against any code. You know, mm -hmm. you don't don't confront me by no other woman from my wife. Fact. You know, no matter what. Right. You know, and and that's what he was saying. He, you know, you could do this to me, but not her. And. When he saw that predicament, I always said that was the setup because David left him there. The role of the publicist, when you see the question going in a direction, you step in front of it and you take the hit. You take the bullet for your client mm -hmm. and you step in front and say, no, the interview's done. He left him sitting there like a lame duck. Mm -hmm. And it just took a life of his own, man. You know, they use that moment because this art collection, one of the largest African-American art collections in the world, and the only way you were able to get to see it, you have to be invited to the homes. And they wanted the world, especially they wanted to inspire black people to start collecting art and start looking at the arts in any art form. And start, you know, finding ways to own the arts, our work, our body of work. Because now, you know, white people want our body of work. They want to own our music. They want to own our paintings, mm -hmm. those type of things. So that was the purpose of it. And then, and then they gave the Smithsonian, um, I think, approximately maybe like $10 million. And we had a gala that night hosted by Sam Jackson, uh, a concert afterwards by Sheila E. But it would not go away. And Mr. Cosby kept calling. He said, you know, what's your thoughts? And I said, look, you got to go out here. I already started parading women out, if you remember. Mm -hmm. And the women, women never said anything. They just read a script. Mm -hmm. And I said, Mr. C., I got something. That we, could, we could do it. I got something to defeat this right now. It will go away. We're going to parade you out with female friends, and you're not going to sit there, and they're going to just talk about you, the man that they know. Mm -hmm. Man, these white attorneys, they were like, no. No. They're like, Bill, why are you listening to him? This is how they would talk to him. Why are you listening to him? It's not going to work. It's not going to work. It's going to go away. It's going to go away. Let it just, let, you don't say nothing. I said, but his silence is going to be guilty. Yeah. He got to say something, but hey, you're leaning on the lawyers. Yeah. And these Marty Singer, who represents the Kardashian, Tom Cruise, all the elites in Hollywood, that's his attorney. So, of course, Marty's telling him it's going to go away, so you believe it. And I never forget on CNN, on, on Reliable uh, to show reliable solutions or something, our uh, Brian Stel Stelter, this guy Bob Huber, who was a writer for Philly Magazine, he said, do not let Ferguson, Mike Brown, take Bill Cosby out the news. When he was able to say that 
about a black kid being murdered in the street in the streets. Don't let the holidays and Ferguson take Bill Cosby out the news. You knew then it wasn't going anywhere. Wow. And we had comedy shows. There were look, man, shows were being canceled everywhere. And Mr. Cosby was just phenomenal because he started just calling people. He was like, hey, I got your money in escrow. I'm going to send it back to you. I'm going to cancel the show myself. And he just started giving money back. He's like, I said, Mr. He's like, don't worry, man. He said, let's let these, let's let these people off the hook. And he just started giving all the money back. He said, Andrew, you have to pay me up front to do a show, but I never touch the money until I do the show and the show's done. He's because if I got sick or anything happened, I, I don't want to have to say, I don't have your money. And now an artist can say, no, you booked me. I booked on that date. You know, I'm keeping the money. Mm -hmm. He won't do that. And they had contracts that said if they canceled mm -hmm. anything, that he gets to keep the money. He just called them up in the venues and he said, no, I'm giving you the money back. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was it took a life of its own because they paraded it never stopped every week. Sometimes three days out of the week, Gloria Allred was parading women out. Then she does an interview in Los Angeles Times saying, Bill Cosby, give me one hundred million dollars and it will all stop, go away. No more women. Mrs. Cosby said, I, she's not getting a dime. Mm. And that's when we knew it was on. Mm. Uh and that's when I knew, I said to him, the attorney, Marty, called me up, and I knew I was being set up. And he said, I need you to get social media people, influencers, to go on social media and start talking about this. We're going to pay you. We're going to send you, you know, a couple hundred grand, and it's going to come through me. I said, no, nah, why would... I do it. I'll let it come through you. It's your idea. Right. Makes sense. Right. And so this was on a Tuesday, man. And uh, that I, I made sure all of the influences, I, re I found somebody in Vegas, L.A., New York, and I made sure that they e put everything in writing and copy Martin on the emails. So that Thursday come, he gets one of Cosby attorneys on the phone, Jack Schmidt. He's like, Andrew has to go. He has to be fired immediately. And I was like, for what? He said, you went out and got social media influencers and nobody told you to. Mm. They set you up. And I had the emails, though. Okay. okay. I had all of the emails. And I, 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 I typed what he told me as he was telling me. And that, that saved me. Yeah. And that's when I knew... That I said, look, man, they're coming after him. And then he had to do a deposition um, with Allred in Boston. And this is 2015 for this civil case we just had uh, in Santa Monica three weeks ago. And Marty walks in with Gloria Allred. He was, they were acting like they hated each other. Right. Like just, they despised each other. And next thing I know, I said, they took a break. I said, let me go in the back hall. We're in this building. And I go in the back hall. And that's when I called Marty and, and Glory on the back hall. He said, look, we're going to keep playing this, and I'm going to get him to settle. And I told Mr. Cosby. And, and the rest is history. That, that day he said, Andrew, when we get back to the hotel, he said, He's totally blind now. And he said, I don't want to leave Marty in the room, but I want him to turn off the lights. Because mm. that's what Ray Charles used to do. Mm -hmm. Ray Charles right. would tell him, Ray Charles shaved in a dark room. He always tell that story. And Ray Charles, even when he fought a manager, he made him turn the lights mm -hmm. off and he'll whoop him. Right. And, <laughs> <laughs> and Cosby said, Marty and then we, so I, I left him in the room and he said, hey, Marty, turn off the lights. <laughs> Next day I know, I see Marty running down the hallway. <laughs> 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 so, and, so, 
and Cosby couldn't get him, but he, <laughs> but he sent the message, okay? Right. And um, that's when I knew. I said, man, if you, I said, I can't guarantee you anything, but if you just hand it over to me, everything. I said, let me vet the attorneys. Let me just do it all. Mm -hmm. Private investigators, let me do it all. Let me do it, cultivate relationships with the media. I'll go live in New York for whatever time. Let's let me do, just give me everything. And I promise you, you'll get to see that the ocean is blue. Mm -hmm. And you'll get to see a little bit to the bottom of the ocean, even though there's no bottom. But you'll get to see some clarity in your life. And he he did do that. But, you know, him, no one ever saw this criminal charges coming. We never saw that coming. Uh, and when this district attorney ran that campaign ad, that Willie Horn style ad, because he had been out campaigning and going to black churches, but never brought up Bill Cosby. Right. He just said, that, hey, I'm going to make the laws fair. You know, I understand this racial profile. I understand this, uh, uh, the justice system, how it's unfair to black people. That was his campaign platform when he went to speak at churches and community groups. He never uttered Bill Cosby's name. And, uh, but when we saw that ad and we saw that he got a significant amount of money from Comcast on NBC, and we always say that my thing is that NBC stands for no Bill Cosby mm. because he tried to purchase NBC. Yeah, I remember. And so we, but we, we just never saw, if somebody had asked me at the height of the allegations, do you see Bill Cosby going to prison? I would say, nah, right. never. Right. And, but going through that trial, man, it was, I knew then that 2017 trial, I knew that I was behind the scenes still. You just saw me walking in with him, mm -hmm. you know, guiding him and just behind the scenes. Right. And it was something in me. And, I, and, and he said, Andrew, my story got to be told. And I need somebody to tell my story. And we were sitting in, he called it his suite. It was just a conference room inside the courthouse. And he was like, this is my dressing room. And he said, look, man, you, you can do it. Just go tell my story. Mm. And go tell what you, just tell what you, you're, sitting, you're watching. You're watching it happen in the courtroom. And uh, he was like, you're doing it behind the scenes. Just go out here and I talk about it. And I was able to go talk about it. And... I brought some life to it to the point where um found out that the jurors were sequestered because this jury came out of Pittsburgh, Allegheny County, and they were sequestered the first trial in 2017, but found out that they were going to Target in the middle of the night, out in the zoo, reading newspapers. Um, and I said, you know what, people are listening, they are watching it. And that's when I found our family members were telling the jurors, like, hey, you got to check this guy out. This guy's putting some stuff out here. Mm. And then, like I say, you have to, in this line of work, man, if you think you're going to go live in some high-rise, bougie situation, and that's where you're going to win at, you might as well just cut your losses, man, and give up this profession. Mm. Because it don't work that way. Right. You got to go and hang out in the streets, man, and get with the real people. Get with the street committee. Get with the people who know where the truth is at, and 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 they they know who's doing what, and they're connected to people, even connected to jurors. And I found out that the janitor, he was listening to everything. Hmm. And the janitor heard the judge come in when they had come back with a not guilty verdict. He made the judge made them go back in and start deliberating again. So the jury said not guilty. They judge said, not, said nah. The, ju the judge said no. Judge O'Neill was like no. Man. Go back in and de de deliberate more. And you you hey man you take care of people okay. 
You, 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 you got it. that's when you have because it's a dirty game. It's it's not yeah. it's not a clean game. You know, yeah, I might wear the suit and tie and right. whatever and all. But this ain't this is this is a gutter game. It's a street game. And when when they come after now in cases, man, I don't care if you're not a famous person. You you have already been dragged through social media. Because somebody's going to talk about a case, believe it or not. It, it, cases now, people we've never heard of, we hear about these cases. And now we we, we pass this judgment. Mm-hmm. And like I said, God judges us. So I don't have a problem with being judged because right. we have judges. I just have a problem with people being overtly critical. Yeah. You know, and when I found that out, I said, nope. He's not going to win on this game. I started calling the judge out. I started calling his wife out who... Were a professor at University of Pennsylvania who was the one that got Mr. Cosby's honorary degrees rescinded. The judge should have excused himself. He should have recused himself. Mm-hmm. He, he sat over his own recusal motion. I'm denying my own motion. Wow. Then he started calling me out in the courtroom. Yeah, Andrew White is saying this about me. It was all personal. Mm-hmm. And I knew then they had to fix in that. But, man, those jurors... They deliberated for 50-plus hours. It was the longest deliberation in the history of Montgomery County. And they came back with a hung jury. We left in that week, beginning of the week. We had to come back on a Saturday. They said, the jury's hung. And I, 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 promised, I had promised Mr. Cosby. I said, look, I went to the... Uh, King of Pressure Mall, and I went to the Rolex store. I said, man, I want to buy me a Rolex. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. I want to get you out of it. I said, look, I, I said, look, man, I'm, 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 I look, hey, I want to keep it gangster some way. <laughs> right, you right. So, I'm getting something. I got to do something for myself. Right. And I, I went, he said, man, Rolex ain't good enough, man. I said, but I want to get you a hung jury. He said, that Rolex ain't good enough, man. He said, they was the sponsor. I spy the Cosby show every season. The, the, every season, the, uh, the cats got Rolexes. Mm. And he was like, they, you know, hey, ain't good enough for you, man. And then um, we got the hung jury. And then he called me up on my birthday. He said, man, I'm blind. And he gave me his watch. Oh, wow. So, wow. And, and it, it's gangster. Yeah. And it's a boogery. And it was okay. a 2001 edition nice. that he won at Sotheby's Auction House. So, man. uh so he kept a gangster, and I told him, I said, man, whenever I'm not with you, I will always be holding your arm, and you will always be with me. Wow. And so, um, and I wear it every day, man, and it it, it, it keeps me on that foundation of, of being who I am and being true to myself, but also understanding, man, this fight is bigger than him now. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not about Bill Cosby. It's about mm-hmm. every black man in this country, and they, they have this formula, and... You know, when we got that one, the, I never forget the, the 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 judge over all the judges. When, we, when they said hung jury, uh, his name is Andrew Delarici. He mm. stood in the back of the courtroom and he looked at Judge O'Neill and the district attorney. He said, "Normally, you'll say, well, let me go rethink this and see if we're going to be able to retry this case." He made him say right then, "No, we're going to retry the case." And man. 2018 comes. Mm-hmm. I get Mesero. I hire him. And I like Tom because Tom, I've been knowing Tom for some years through an attorney who passed away, Charles Savaggio, an Italian guy. Charles, Charles handled every criminal and drug case for every black person and got him off in Birmingham, Alabama. Mm. So what Tom would do, Tom would fly in from L.A. And all black people cases in L.A., him and Charles, for 20 years, they did them for free. Any black person that was charged criminally that they worked on together, they did it all for free in Birmingham, Alabama for 20 years. Great. And um, I knew Tom's body of work. And so I, I said, we got to get Mesero. But Mesero, we we talk, we talk almost twice a week. Or, and we had dinner in L.A. And, and I always tell him the biggest mistake he made, he thought he can try this case like Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson lived in Santa Clara. Mm. Mr. Cosby didn't live in Montgomery County. He's a Philly guy. Right. If it was in Philly like Meat Meal, mm-hmm. yeah, you get the jury from Philly. Mesereau said, no, I'm going to get the jury from Montgomery County. Well, the judge was voted in. He was popular. The district attorney won there. 
and Mesro wouldn't listen. I said, no, let the let the Pennsylvania State Supreme Court pick someone like Erie, Pennsylvania, because those mm-hmm. small coal mining towns, they don't believe in this type of stuff, man. Right. You know, and they 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 got side pieces. They know what this game is all right. about. Right. And like I say, Mr. Cosby ain't no perfect man. Right, right. It was the infidelity there. Yeah, it was. It's not against you the know, law, though. You know, that's a part of the right. industry, man. He was, Mrs. Cosby would pick him up from the Playboy Mansion. Right. You know, so right. it, it, it's not like, you know, he's this perfect character, uh, a, a, a human being who has not stepped outside uh, of his marriage. But that was between them. That's yeah. between the husband and wife. Okay. That has nothing to do with the public or any family members. Absolutely. But in 2018, man, I knew the fix was in. That jury, man, was, they all knew the judge. We, they all heard about the case. They were sequestered. We had a Muslim on the jury, uh, and a black male, uh, an older black female, and they all voted. And I knew, I went to, we went to lunch, man, and it was a feeling I got. And I said, man, we're not gonna win this one, man. And I just knew it. I just—it was just—I could—I could watch the jurors, and they just—they looked at him in disgust. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Many of them, when he got up and walked, and you know he's blind. If he heard something loud, because now his hearing is, is heightened because of the blindness, mm-hmm. and he'll jump, and he just had to use. He's, 80 years old, man. He had to use the bathroom. You're like, and he wanted them to take a break. He was like, I just want, I want to take a, a a pee break. And they, and 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 the jurors frowned on that. And, but, you know, looking at them, man, and I, I could tell you, I knew we wasn't gonna win that case. No matter what I did, I knew. And he kept saying, he said, Andrew. He said. I don't think we're going to get this one, man. He said, because uh, Mesero should have listened to you and not get this jury from Montgomery County. Mm. He said, I don't think we're going to get it. He said, but I'm preparing myself. He said, they're going to they're gonna make me do time because they got to make an example out of me. He knew it. Man. He knew it. He said, they're going to make me do time. And I said, hey, man, no verdict has come back yet. But in my heart, yeah. I knew. Yeah. And... They said they had a verdict, so we rushed back, and Detective Schaefer, who was one of the detectives who investigated this, he gave me the middle finger in the mm. courtroom. Mm. Mm. And I was, my attorney, the attorney out of Birmingham, Tom Larkin, I, I, he knew uh, where my temper could go. He said, no, you're going to leave the courtroom. So you're going to go and leave right now, mm-hmm. and you're going to go get yourself together. Mm-hmm. He said, because you're going to let them mess you up, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to take away from the character of Mr. Cosby. Because if you get out here and fight, or you got him get too emotional, you lose who you are. Yeah. And But I'm like, man, but I'm human. You know, like... He just gave me the middle finger. I know what they're about to do to him. And he was like, it's the system. That's what you've been talking about, the system. He said, so you got to beat them at the system. And I thought about it. I said, well, man, it took a while for me to get myself together. Yeah, to come Because it just takes a minute, man. You know, when you're in that moment. And I don't like to lose, man. I, I don't right, like yeah, to lose. Yeah. But I'm not a sore loser. Mm-hmm. I, I, and I, I don't have a problem with jealousy. I have a problem with envy. Mm-hmm. You no, know, because it's okay to be jealous of your opponent to say, All right, I want to be jealous of him so I could go practice harder and be better than him next time or her. Yeah. So it's a, jealousy is not a bad thing because mm-hmm. that could give you a different grind to say, this is what I'm going to I'm gonna work on my skill sets mm-hmm. to be great at whatever I'm trying to be great at. The envy is the stuff I, I don't have, I, I don't like. Right. Like, I don't have a problem with a person using the person. We all get used for something. Somebody used us to do this. Just don't misuse me. Mm-hmm. And when, they, when he did that to me, I knew, and they came back with a guilty verdict. And that's when Mr. Cosby 
did lose his cool in the courtroom and the district attorney said i want him remanding the custody now he's a flight risk and the judge said well he hasn't left it. we've been going through this trial for two years the judge is acting like if he want to be fair now right and mr Collins, he said he has a plane and, and and online it says and we know it's more than that but online it says net worth is 400 million dollars and mr Cosby said I ain't got no damn plane, fool. Because you know <laughs> we had sold the planes. They right. were 30 yeah. plus years old. And uh, he, we get back to the house, man. And uh, Mrs. Cosby, I told her. And he was, you know, he said, Andrew, I'm telling you, they're going to put me in prison, man. man. And... He said, "Won't we'll start." He had just buried his daughter, who died two months before the trial, Insa, and she had renal failure. And he said, "I'm gonna start preparing myself." And that happened on a Friday, the guilty verdict. Saturday, I'm standing in the guest house. He said, "I want to see you, Andrew." I come to the main house. He's lying on the sofa in the sitting room. He said, "Okay." They're going to put me in the iron box. He said, but you don't have to figure out how to tell my story now. He said, because they're going to try to make me die here. He said, and it's, it's, this is going to be their attempt to murder me. And he said, this is the way they assassinate us. Mm. And what's so interesting about this prison, it's named SCI Phoenix now, but it was called Greaterford. And what's so interesting, in 1970, he did a documentary with his friends in Greaterford. Mm. And now he's about to go into this prison. And he decides he's not going to do a sentencing memorandum. He's not going to bring people in to plead his case, to talk about his character. And when that set with September came, man, Mr. Cosby, he said, let me tell you something, man. He said, we had breakfast together every morning. I would go, I'd go work out at 3 in the morning, and we had breakfast together at 5. And I'm an early riser anyway, so that's why I do. And he, that morning we had breakfast together. He said, hey, man, it'll be our last time having breakfast together for a while. Damn. He said, they're going to give me time, man. And I said, no, nah, Mr. C. I said, man, look, you're 80-something years old. He's not going to give you no time. It's no way. Why would he do that? I said, they are going to label you a sexual violent predator uh, where you can't be around your grandchildren or any children. Uh, they said that he was, a, he was a terror to the community, that he could get out and start raping women and drugging them. Wow. Uh, blind. And, and that's what the... and and. When they got to the courthouse, man, he, and he, we sat there, waited, and the judge threw the book at him, and it was a death sentence. And he, man, he never lost his cool or edge. He smiled. He smiled. And I'm sitting there, because when he was found guilty, I had to go back to that, back to that. In my mind, because we were all emotional, man. Right. And you can't help but be. I don't mind right. saying as a man, I was just emotional right. because, you know, you you put your life into this, man. And and I literally, I tell everybody, man, when I believe in something, I believe in a person's innocence, and I'm out here, I interject my life into this. I become a part of that situation. I'm going through it with you and your family. I'm going to look. I'm going to use my money to keep the family afloat. Mm -hmm. You know, because you're in it. You, you know, when you're in it with a person, you're family now. Right. And like, we're in this together. And I, uh, I went back to that moment where he told me if anybody was crying to get rid of them, mm. he said, because man, <laughs> this is the real fight. And I was, so I went back to that moment. So when he was, when they sentenced him to three to ten years, I said, "Mr. C, I got to take out. Give me your tie, give me your bracelet." And uh, he, he he made a joke. 
They want my tie. What they think? They're going, I'm going to hang myself. <laughs> and he said, I said, I said, well, they're going to take your shoelaces yeah. too and all that. He said, not my shoelaces. The only thing he was concerned about was cold showers. Because one of the attorneys joked with him and said, man, they do the cold showers. He said, I don't want no cold shower. Man. <laughs> That's all he was concerned about, cold shower. But he prepared himself over that summer, man. He started giving up certain foods. Uh, he prepared himself for what prison was going to be like. He started giving up certain things in life. Uh, when they put that ankle bracelet on him, he stayed in Philly, his Philly home. And, and he prepared himself mentally for it. And I walked him to the offices and he said, hey, this is the last time you're going to get to walk me. He said, but when you go out there today, he said, listen. Mongo Slade, Sharp Eye Washington, those are the characters for Uptown Saturday Night because uh, Richard Pryor played Sharp Eye Washington. We joke with each other about that. He said, give it to them. Mm-hmm. Give it to them. And I had met with Far- Farrakhan Pryor uh, before he was sentenced. Farrakhan said, look, Brother Bill uh, sponsored all of the buses for the Million Man March. Wow. Ooh. He said, we don't want nothing from Brother Bill. He said, but Brother Bill will be protected. They're going to put him in. He said, I'm telling you, they're going to put him in there. But Brother Bill don't have to worry about a thing, and he owes the nation nothing. Mm. He said, because he's done for the nation and the world more than we should have done for him. We didn't do for him the way he did for us. We didn't stand by him. And... I remember Farrakhan's words, and Mr. Cosby said, look, man, I'm going to be okay. And uh, I went out, and I gave the speech of a lifetime. He said, look, you got to take care of my wife now. And you got you to gotta be in this fight with my wife. And Mrs. Cosby has ran the show from day one, man. We'll be on the phone all day, and we always talk every night at 11 o'clock when she's swimming. She goes swimming, and he built an Olympic-sized pool at the Massachusetts property and uh, around his cars, man. And, and she swims at night. We'll talk to 2 in the morning, and we'll come up with plans. She's like, okay, Mr. Wyatt, what do you want to do now? What do you, what, what's the new plan? I said, we're going to do this. I'm gonna, I flew in every day, man. Um, I would fly in. His skin started breaking open when he was in prison, and he didn't have lotion. And Mrs. Cosby, she said, can you get some stuff in to him? I said, Mrs. C. I, I'm, I got in with some correction officers. Yeah. Matter of fact, I'm dating one of them. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, I, and man, I started yeah. making, I'll fly in, man, every other week to Philly. And I'll put uh, tea tree oil together, uh, lavender oil together, uh, put a lotion together, let it soak overnight. And, man, I put it in my waistband in Ziploc bags. And, man, they always gave me a private room with him. So mm-hmm. he'll lotion up, man. And I did that. And we only spent, he could spend three hours with me. We only spent 45 minutes together. Wow. And he will tell me how he would channel Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela would tell him how he was in Robin Island. They would give him a tin cup with porridge in there. And for breakfast, they would put a piece of sugar cube in the middle of the porridge, he'd eat around it. And he'd say the sugar cube, that would be his dessert. Mm-hmm. And then for lunch, they'd give him the same tin cup with porridge. And they would put a piece of broccoli in there. He'd eat around the broccoli, and that would be his vegetable. He'd say the vegetable. Then for dinner, they'd give him that same tin cup with porridge. They'd put a piece of fat back in the middle, just a little piece of meat. He'd eat around that. That'd be his protein. Mm-hmm. So what Cosby did, he would take all his food and put it under the sink in the prison and wash it off. Just to get the salt. He said, look, man, they're trying to make my blood pressure go up and stuff like that. They're they're, they're trying to knock me off. He said, I know what they're trying to do to me. And he would rinse it off. And then they started telling him he couldn't rinse his food off. You know, you can't rinse your food off. And he would rinse his eggs off. Uh, And he would just eat them. He would put them in a cup, man. And he would eat them after he gets shaked up in the cup and get the salt off. And then I visited him and I always said, man, the creator, man, knows what he's doing. We might not understand. And when I visited him, since he's blind, he can't see. His eyes were bloodshot red. Mm-hmm. 
And I, I called Mrs. Cosby. I said, something ain't right. And he couldn't get his pressure down. And uh, she, I called the prison and I told the warden, so let me tell you something. I will have cameras out here. If something happened to him, if you don't get him to a doctor and they found out that his carotid arteries on the left and right side had 90% blockage each due to plaque buildup. Wow. And they cleaned them out. If it wasn't for prison, prison saved his life. Yeah. That saved his life because he went in knowing he had blockage but never told anyone because he loved his pizza, cheese, steaks, hoagies, right. and that kind of stuff. And um, But he actually be put in general population. And, man, the inmates would come up to me. Guys, they, I, I remember the year they, they started letting death row inmates have visitation. And then some who got to meet him, because it's a big, big prison, guys would come up to me, man, and say, look, if you leave, if you leave Uncle Bill, we're going to have somebody kill you, man. They would just come <laughs> say that to me. <laughs> <laughs> like, and, and, they, and this guy, Anthony Sutton, we call, we call him Benny Do, And he was part of Dream Black Mafia. And Benny Do, he, they call him Benny Do because you tell him to do it, he'll do it. <laughs> and uh, he's been in there for 36 years. Son has been in there with him for 12 years. Damn. Benny, a big dude. He came up behind me one day, man. And he said, let me tell you something, man. But the Godfather, he don't call you Andrew in here. He call you his son. Mm. And Benny Hens, a huge, big dude. He's like, let me tell you something. You a five-star flat-footed general. Mm. And, man, he said, I got six guys surround him every day. Wow. And they take him to his doctor's appointments, and they make sure he's safe. He said, one guy got smart with him. I made him get on his knees and apologize to the Godfather. Mm. He said, because what he just did for my life, man, he showed me how to be a man. He showed me, he talked with me. He said, man, I cried for the first time when he sat in a room and he touched my hand. And he said, Benny, you don't have to live this life. Benny's in there for life. And Benny said, but I'm innocent, man. He framed me. I didn't do the murder. He said, tell Andrew. So now I got Benny an attorney, and they're working pro bono. Nice. And, uh, you know, Benny talked to him yesterday, but he said, man, he's, he's a, he said, man, the Godfather, because that's what he called him, the Godfather. He said, he said, a guy walked up to him, Andrew. He was like, you Bill Cosby. You got a spot in your clothing, man. And hey, look at them shoes, man. Get some J's. You go get your... Cosby said, man, look at him, man. You a sorry piece of whatever. He said, your family is struggling to put money in your books. And you worried about Jays in prison. Mm. And Cosby started participating in Man Up. And that guy came back and apologized to him. He said, man, you were right. And the Man Up program, man, he, he started uplifting guys. And guys would get out of prison. And he would give them my number. And they would call me. And I'll meet up with them. One guy, Andre, had been in there for 58 years, man. Went in when he was 16 years old, got out of 58. Wow. He's free now. Uh, and I talked to him. And and Mr. Cosby has touched so many lives. And and everybody told me he went into prison, not as Bill Cosby, the comedian actor. He was just William Cosby. Mm. And they said when he walked in, it was just a respect. And the correctional officers would say, Bill, we need you to do this. He'll stop them. He said, whoa, whoa, whoa. What's your last name? They said, Smith. He said, Mrs. Smith, I'm Mr. Cosby. Respect me so I can respect you. And they said that's how he operated on the block. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing, man, to see when I saw him and every day he went in at 220-something pounds. When he got out, he was 187. Wow. Now, I'll be honest with you all, man. Uh, another six months, he wouldn't, be, he wouldn't have been alive. Another six months, he wouldn't have been. Uh, he was telling us that because the pandemic hit and that his prison was the most infected prison out of all the prisons in the state of Pennsylvania. You had over 100 people that died of COVID. He never got COVID. Jeez. Uh, and, but when I saw him... Because I had not seen him since March 
of uh, 2020, March 10th, because that pandemic shut down the country. But I'm telling you, if you had to just saw him, he he wouldn't have he he wouldn't have made it. Mm. And he was ready to do the full ten years. He that, that, last year he denied himself parole March of last year, and he said, "Man, I'm going to die here, but I'm not giving myself parole. I would die here." Wow, powerful, yeah, powerful. Uh, yeah, man. Um, you got anything else? You nah, got? we're good right now. Yeah, yeah. That was whew, this definitely the most powerful interviews we ever done. Honestly, you know, for yeah. you just to give us that information that raw and uncut. Definitely appreciate it. We're sitting here almost just listening. Like, yeah. just sitting here like I'm sorry, man. I didn't mean to take up. No, 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 it, no, no, no. It's great, man. No, don't even worry about it. Um, if you can, what what's going to be next? What's the next agenda for you guys? You and Mr. Cosby. Next, uh, phase one mm-hmm. happened last week. Uh, it would happen on June 30th for the one year anniversary of his conviction being vacated by the Pennsylvania State okay. Supreme Court. Okay. You know, I did a, a nice video. Piece, uh, unseen footage of me holding the camera, driving him okay. home to freedom. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we let him do his first interview, break his silence. Uh, and just for people to hear his voice, mm-hmm. you guys got to talk to him. Bless yeah. And uh, you recorded it. So I hope, yeah. I hope and pray that you will play it just to let people hear his voice and the, the, the positive things that he's saying, the uplift. Mm-hmm. Uh, how to persevere and things that he talked to you guys about and share with your children and 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 right. that's phase that was phase one phase part of phase one his birthday was yesterday uh, we celebrated that he's at his New York property with okay. Mrs Cosby and phase two it's time what I like to do man it's not about me mm-hmm. and it won't ever be about me mm-hmm. because if I make it about me it's not going to be successful. So phase two is to get Mr. Cosby out here to talk to you guys, talk to, be on your show, awesome, um, and and get get let his voice be heard. Man. Yes, and 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 he he's the celebrity, he's the iconic figure. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I'm just doing the work of, of of not comparing myself, just doing the Moses work. Yes, you know, yes, and uh, yeah. and just trying to deliver. You know, delivered. You know, at the hands of Egypt, which represents bondage, and so Absolutely. it's bondage now. We're on this strange land, man, and and a lot of people are in bondage and mm-hmm. and trying to figure out how to tell their stories and do it in the most profound way of just being truthful, truthful, being honest, um, no fabrications, mm-hmm. just sticking with the facts of the case, man. And and what I love about this last trial we had. No punitive damages for him, uh, because if he had been found guilty of punitive damages, he would have had to write that woman a check for twenty five million dollars. They only awarded her five hundred thousand dollars, and uh, she would never get to see a dime of it because we were filing an appeal. She has a five million dollar legal bill, mm. so that's that's what's next. And and we have another trial. Well, another case was filed here in New Jersey against oh, him wow. by Lily Bernard, and she wants two hundred fifty million dollars. Uh, mm-hmm. And so we filed a motion two weeks ago, actually, judge to dismiss it. Mm-hmm. But if he don't, then uh, we will have a trial out right here in civil court, okay. in federal court. So right here in New Jersey. Okay. And uh, we hope, man, that you guys would bring your show there. For sure, that and, was and, and, yeah. and and because it's you know it would be right here in your backyard, okay. and uh, we, we want him to you know it's it's important now for him to tell his story, Absolutely. you know, and he don't have to talk. I told him, I said, look, Mister C, you don't have to talk about the women. The media has already done that job. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about life. Let's talk about legacy. Let's talk about yeah. how we could rebuild our communities with this time that you have, yeah. you know, because. God gave it to you for a reason. He let you go through this in your golden ages, man. You who would ever thought Bill Cosby would go to prison? Nobody. So, mm. you know, and and this is about man, your children, mm. and your family, and and my grandson, my daughter, my nephews and nieces. We gotta we gotta do these shows to protect them, man. So whatever I can do, I'm here to support, man. Appreciate and, it. Uh, and and just people gotta understand, man. The boogeyman, the black man is not the boogeyman. The entertainment industry has labeled us the boogeyman. And mm-hmm. and when they want to take down a black man in this country, the history is real. 
The history is there. You use sex in a white woman when you want to destroy a black man. Yeah. I'm not saying all white people are bad because all black right. people are not good. Right, right. But Get I'm it. just saying that's the history of America. Yeah. And understanding our history is so important. And, and don't go through life trying to fight corruption. Mm-hmm. You'll never win. You got to fight corrupt people. You know, no. corrupt people, when you destroy the corrupt person who's bringing forth the corruption, you destroy the, some of that corruption. But if you just, corruption is abstract. You can't see it. Mm-hmm. But you can't see a corrupt person. Mm. Mr. White. Well, thank you. Andrew. We call you Andrew. Andrew, you thank you, you so much. Andrew, even that sounds so crazy <laughs> to say. <laughs> thank Sitting you so much, man. This man, oh man, we definitely appreciate you from just the kind words to you setting foot into our studio. Absolutely. Honored on every level, and you have a platform anytime. Literally, you call us, you're on anytime you want. We're honored to have you on, Mr. Andrew White of the hip, uh, uh, excuse me, Andrew White on the Hip Hop and Sense Podcast. Been a true blessing, brother. Slow. Man, thank you, man, for being a blessing to my life and being a blessing to the Cosby's and a blessing to the world. And uh, hey, man, let's keep on moving forward and keep on pushing. Honored. Yes, yes sir. Thank you. Indeed. Thank you. All right.